Hello everyone. We are continuing Daniel chapter 9 and we're actually going to finish it today. There's only four verses left, but oh, are they packed with some exciting things. We're going to start in verse 24, but just to remind us what happened at the end of last week when we were reading, uh, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, has been sent to Daniel in response to his prayer that we looked at last week, that heartfelt prayer. And he's come and he says um, in verse 23, Gabriel's talking. By the way, did you notice that um, unlike when Gabriel first appeared to Daniel, Daniel did not um, shake and quake and faint in fear. Um, he, he, he understood now. This is sent from God. This is Gabriel. Verse 23, Gabriel says, the moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I'm here to tell you what it was for you're very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. Wasn't that touching? Didn't that have to mean so much to Daniel? To Just to be reminded by the angel of God that God um, saw Daniel as precious. Daniel is precious to him. And so he has sent an answer. What a, what a comfort for us today. You and I, we are just as precious in our Father's sight. And he loves to send us answers and understanding as we delve into his word. And Gabriel says, listen carefully so you can understand the meaning of your vision. And he begins. Here we go. Verse 24. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people. Now, we just have to stop right there. Do you remember we reminded ourselves last week that Daniel was thinking in literal terms of 70 years. He read that in, in Jeremiah. And so he's thinking 70 years and he's doing the math and he's thinking, oh, it's 60-something now. Uh, you know, the restoration of my, of my country is going to happen in a few years' time. So although he's just been so warmly encouraged through Gabriel, he begins talking, says, a period of 70 sets of seven. I wonder, this is just me wondering, I wonder about these things. I try to put my own emotions sometimes in the Bible characters that I'm reading and thinking, now how would I feel? I wonder if there wasn't a little touch of, oh no, I thought it was a few more years. Oh no, 70 sets of seven. But as we're going to find out, as we delve into these last four verses, what has been promised instead of just a few more years and the what has been promised Oh my, remember his ways are not our ways. They're far better, far better than anything we can dream, aren't they? Let's continue. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most high place. Wow, there's a lot happening there. Now, hold those thoughts, and we're going to continue now into verse 25, and then we'll come back to verse 24. It's like a circle here, and it will make better sense to us. So let's proceed now into verse 25. Now listen and understand. Seven, not 70, when I first started studying this, I, for some reason, I, I, my brain was in 70, and I kept thinking 70 sets of seven plus 62, and I could not get it, right? I'm not a mathematician. I just could not get it. It was driving me crazy. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, the Messiah, comes. And Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. Now, there is a lot to look at here. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. And even in the beginning of verse 24, 70 sets of seven. Well, theologians have been talking about this um, for eons of time. Is it seven units? Is it seven days, seven weeks, seven years? But actually, at this time, when people were looking at it, they, they, I could have understand more debate. Not so today, because this prophecy, as we're going to find out, has already been fulfilled. Oh, exciting it is, too. And the only way it, the dates fit is to make this years, 70 sets of years. And then here, seven sets of years, plus 62 sets of years. That's the only way it totally makes sense, and we're about to find out why. Seven sets of seven 
Now that's 49 years plus 62 sets of seven. I'm looking at my, I've got a cheat sheet here. I can't keep math numbers in my brain. Plus 434 years, that's 62 times seven. Now that equals 483 years. Now I just want to pop back up here to verse 24. I, I, I hope this is gonna sound simple in the end. <laughs> I don't know if you don't have a mathematician's brain. I, I, I certainly don't. And I had to go over and over and over and wipe my brow and think, oh my goodness. But I, I think we'll get somewhere this morning. Verse 24 again, a period of 77 sets of seven. Now that's 490 years. But when we look in verse 25, we see seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. Now that's 483 years. Well, that leaves seven more years. Hold that thought. We're going to get to that later. I just wanted to point that out. Now, that's 483 years. Now, during this time, you and I, we go by a 365-day calendar, you know, a, 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 another day added during leap year. But um, 465, 365 days. Now, during the Babylonian time, and Daniel would have grown up with a 360 day calendar. So hold that thought in mind. So we've got seven sets of seven, which is 49 years, 62 sets of seven, which is, I have to look at my thing again, 434 years. And that equals 483 years. Now, if you times that, listen carefully here, 483 years multiplied by 360 days, because we're going to use the Babylonian calendar, that equals 173,880 days. I'll repeat that. 173,880 days. Hold that thought or write it down or listen again. <clears throat> I have to keep going back and looking. I've written it all down on my, on my paper. I can't remember all the numbers. We all have our talents. Math isn't mine. <laughs> um, by the way, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. I read lots of theologians, books, research. I'm sure you do too. Um, I could not make any sense of this on my own. So this is not my brilliance. I'm so thankful the Lord gave understanding and such brilliance to Dr. Jack Van Empey. I've read many theologians, but when I read his book on Daniel, and he had these numbers. I'm getting these numbers from him, and I've checked it here, and in my own, I'm convinced that he, this is correct, and that's why I'm sharing it with you. If you come up with something different, do tell, uh, but I, I believe he is correct. I believe the Lord gave him some real <clears throat> understanding here. Now, it says, these years, these 483 years, will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, that would be I've got to look at my dates here again. That would be um, 445 BC, the year 445 BC. How do we know that? That is from Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Let me just briefly flip there for you. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Um, it's during the reign of King Artaxas and Nehemiah. And uh, just briefly, these first eight verses, the king sees Nehemiah and he's appearing downcast. And so he says to him, why are you looking so sad? And Nehemiah, um, he says, well, king, how can I not look sad? Because my city lies in ruins. The walls and streets have been destroyed. Will you give me permission to go back and rebuild the walls, rebuild the streets, rebuild Jerusalem, the city? And he gives his permission. This was in the year 445 B.C., now, some have made a mistake or become confused because there are several Old Testament references like Ezra 1, 2 to 4, which talks about um, giving permission to rebuild the temple. And that happened in 587 BC. And then people understandably, oh, I, I do this. I, I would get confused. And, but this does not say anything about rebuilding the temple. There are several references in the Old Testament that talk about rebuilding the temple. Don't confuse that with this passage here. This specifically says, let me read it again, verse 25, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven, that's 483 years, will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes and it will be built with streets, strong defenses, etc., 
That happened, that command was given, as we've just read, in 445 BC. Now, from the start of that, and we fast forward 483 years, or 173,880 days, do you know what that takes us to? 32 AD, the year that Christ was crucified. Do you find that mind-blowing? <laughs> I just find that so exciting. I mean, it's actually here precise. Now, it says, until a ruler, the anointed one, the Messiah, comes. You will recall from reading in the four Gospels that Jesus often, have you wondered why sometimes he would, for example, heal someone and they would go away shouting and praising and Jesus would say, don't tell anyone. Did, have you ever wondered? I thought, well, why would he? It's a testimony. Why not tell anyone? Why did he say, keep this to yourself? Don't tell anyone. Because Jesus knew his time had not yet come to be totally revealed who he is. Now, you'll recall on his, what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, when he knew he was going to his death, um, on that week before what we call Palm Sunday, because the Bible tells us people took palm fronds and they waved it on him as he was coming on a donkey down the street, and they would put it on the path so he could walk over it. And it's, that's why we call it Palm Sunday. It was Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as he was acknowledging for all, I am the Messiah. Do you see what this means here? Until a ruler, the anointed one comes, Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses. He was coming. So from the time the order was given to rebuild Jerusalem until 48, four. 183 years later, in AD 32, Jesus, as it says here, the anointed one comes. Messiah presents himself. Now, let me just read on. Just the beginning of verse 26. And after this period, and when Jesus comes, the anointed one will be killed. He was crucified. We know that. Now, remember I said I want to go back up to verse 24, because once we understand 25 and the first part of 26, and we see what has already been fulfilled, and now we see to the very year. How exciting is that? To the very year. Um, we can now go back and better understand verse 24, and here's why. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and for your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt. Well, how could their sin be atoned for? Well, Jesus, death on the cross, wasn't it? That's how. To confirm the prophetic vision, Daniel's having it, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, this is exciting. The most holy place. What is that? Well, that's um, that's be behind that's the, the high altar where only the high priest went in once a year. Remember in the temple, there were the outer courts and people could bring a lamb, a turtle dove uh, without spot and blemish to offer to the priest who would take it and sacrifice it, the blood spilled, representing the blood that was to come in Jesus, but the, the blood spilled for their forgiveness of their daily sins. And then once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil. He's the only one who could go to make um, atonement for the sins of the nation. Now, let's go back to verse 24. It says, to bring everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. And what happened when Jesus was crucified? The Bible tells us, you know, it says, and the veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And it's very thick. It was feet thick, indicating man could not do it. Jesus tore, the Holy Spirit tore. It was torn by the power of God alone, representing now, let me read this to you. This is exciting. Now we understand better Hebrews 4, verse 14. It says, so then, since we have a great high priest, Jesus is now our high priest. We don't need one who can represent the nation's sins only going back there once a year. When Jesus died, the veil was torn in two. It says, let us hold firmly to what we believe this high priest, Jesus of ours. He understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings that we do. He's tempted in every way like us, yet he did not sin. So therefore... Let us come boldly to the throne, to the high place. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious, glorious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. 
Do you see what was prophesied here? What was to come? Do you see how this is so exciting in this verse 24 that, that Gabriel was saying, uh, there's, there's someone coming who's going to put an end to sin to bring everlasting right, everlasting righteousness and to confirm the prophetic vision to anoint the most high place, the veil torn in two. That is what this is pointing to. Ah, let's read on. So back to verse 26 now. After this period of 62 sets of seven, now that's 483 years, um, the anointed one will be killed. I love what it says here, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Well, that's what Satan thought. He thought he killed him, thought he did away with him, appearing to have accomplished nothing. We know better than that. Then it says, a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. Now, this is not referring to the Antichrist here. This is a literal thing uh, that happened only 38 years in the same generation as many of the people who lived with Christ. 38 years after Jesus was killed in, in 70 AD, a new Roman emperor named Titus, he came and uh, he destroyed uh, Jerusalem and its temple. In fact, Jesus himself makes a, prophet, prof, a prophecy concerning that. Matthew 24 and the second verse. Do you remember he was walking with his disciples and he was pointing out various things of the temple and the city walls. And then he makes this statement, there's a time coming when not one stone will stand on another for it will be destroyed. And it did happen just 38 years later, uh, 70 AD, uh, 38 years after his death, when, when that happened. And so we see that here, prophesied it would happen. It did happen. Jesus himself said it would happen. Then we go, the next sentence, the end will come. And I see this as the final end. Um, you'll see it too. Remember, just a, a brief reminder here, when the Bible was originally written in manuscripts um, or the books or the letters in the New Testament, it, of course, we know this, it wasn't written with chapters and verses, the numbers, it wasn't. That came later. Uh, I believe it was in the 1200s. It was, a, it was one of the, arch, the Archbishop of Canterbury named Stephen Langton who first divided things just for our easy reference. So we don't have to go all through the book of John to find the verse that says, for God so loved the world. We know it's John 3.16. We can easily find it. So this was a manuscript written. We tend to put, when we read things, our mind, we read a verse and then we read another verse and we think it's all periods of time in one verse and another verse and one chapter and another chapter, but not necessarily so, and certainly not here. It says the end will come with a flood and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. And I believe that to be the millennial reign of Christ, the start of the millennial reign, the end of the seven years. And we'll see why as we go on. Um, I just want to share a thus wonders Vicky moment. Uh, when I read the end will come with a flood and the war, and I'm thinking a flood and the war, and I wondered if it wasn't um, a flood of blood. Uh, Revelation 14, 20, that's the reference that tells us that uh, during the time of uh, Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon, there's going to be such death and killing that blood, people's blood is going to flow up to the level of a horse's bridle, a horse's bridle. That's a flood of blood. And thus wonders Vicky. I don't know. It doesn't say. I'm just wondering, is that what this is even referring to? Will come with a flood and war and its and its miseries decreed from that time to the very end. Now let's read verse 27. The ruler, and now we know we're coming into the time of the Antichrist. How do we know that? We'll read on. The ruler will make a treaty with the people people of Israel, for a period of one set of seven. Now, we've already determined, and I hope agreed, that a set of seven is seven years. I think we can agree that just by the math given previously. One period of seven years, and we know the first three and a half years will indeed seem to be peaceful, but then the Antichrist, we know, is going to break that treaty, and, um, and oh, terrible thing is going to happen. He'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings in the temple, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate of this defiler is finally poured out on him. Let me read this. I want us to go to Revelation 13. I'm going to start with verse 11. Listen to this. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth, 
Um, remember, the first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet, and they work hand in hand. Um, I start to say something. I'm going to say it in a minute. I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb. He spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Don't forget, there's going to come a time, this is what I was going to say a while ago, there's going to come a time when the Antichrist will be assassinated. He'll be dead. But mimicking Jesus, he's going to rise from the dead. Satan will have that power, will be granted that power to let him rise from the dead. Remember, we have in the end times, we have two unholy, we have one holy alliance and one unholy, two alliances, two trinities. The holy alliance, we know, is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The unholy alliance is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And they're going to try to mimic, and they will deceive many people. I encourage myself, though, that we also know in re during the time of Revelation is going to be the world's greatest revival, when great numbers of people will indeed see through this, and they will turn to Jesus Christ. They'll no doubt be killed for it most instantly. Um, but we do know that, and I comfort myself, that although there will be many to see, there will be many who will re indeed recognize the truth. So in verse 13, uh, he, the Antichrist, he did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down from, uh, to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And they can be watching because of the internet and television, can't they? And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, this is the second one also doing miracles, he was, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue. This statue is actually going to talk. It's not going to be like an animation. It's going to talk, to speak. And then the statue of the beast will command that anyone refusing to worship it must die. And then you read on where the requirement is going to be made to have either on the right hand or the forehead the mark of the beast, 666, in order to purchase anything, uh, to sell anything, to live, really. And so that's going to happen, but it is prophesied right here, getting back to verse 27. It says, after half this time, he'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings of the Jewish people and a climax, set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. And let me just flip over there. We know where that is in Revelation 19 and verse 20. It says this, both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. They're going to get thrown there before Satan himself. So we see the correlation between Daniel, between Revelation, uh, between many scriptures in, in the New Testament. But wow, we see this. Now, I want to go back to the math. So I've got to look at my paper again because my brain does not hold mathematical calculations. Okay. Now listen very carefully to this. We're going back to where it talks about the seven years plus the 62 sets of years. So we've got seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. 49 years um, plus, let's see, 60, 49 years <laughs> plus the 434 years, which equals 483 years. Let me say that again because I confuse myself. Seven sets of seven, 49 years, plus 62 sets of seven, 434 years, which equals <clears throat> 483 years, which leaves seven more years. Because in the beginning, verse 24, a period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people until all these things are accomplished. Sin is finally gone. The one, the anointed ones, he's going to sit on the throne of David. We know that. Um, to begin the millennial reign. So those seven years are accounted for when we flip back to verse 27, when we talk about the Antichrist and those, he will make a treaty with his people for a period of one set of seven. So there we have the 490 years. So the 490 years was mentioned in verse 24. It's broken down in verse 25, the 49 years plus the 434 years, which equals 483 years, 
we see all that happens and takes place during that time until we then fast forward to the time of the Antichrist. This last seven years is all left, is all that's left to be completed. Now, I'm just going to share why I find this exciting. I think you will too. When we read that the first 483 years has already come to pass, and when we read such calculations as even 173,880 days, like to the very year, to the very time, AD 32, 483 years brings us from the time the temple, the Jerusalem was decreed to be rebuilt in 445, all the way to AD 32, that is 483 years. And we have it, the most precise biblical prophecy that has been fulfilled, the most precise one, and here it is. And how interesting too, by the way, that Gabriel was the one sent to Daniel because it was Gabriel who was sent to Mary, wasn't it, to say you're going to have the Christ child. <clears throat> Just an interesting thing that he was given uh, that duty to give the meaning of this prophecy and to prophesy to Mary that she was going to bring forth the Christ child, which indeed she did. When we see such precision, of what has already taken place, the very years, the number of years to the time Jesus was presented in his triumphal entry as Messiah, to the time he was killed, to the, the, the veil being torn in two, um, so that verse 24 is fulfilled to anoint the most holy place. Jesus became the high priest. When we look at all that and see it has been fulfilled in such minute detail, for me, it excites me because if that was true and came to pass and it did, then why should we doubt anything else? Why should we doubt that we are in the end times where we read all the signs, looking in Matthew 24 and other places of the New Testament, things that Paul said? Why should we doubt that it's going to happen when we look at such precision at what happened in these last four verses of Daniel 9. What a faith builder. How exciting. Jesus is coming again. There will be a final end. The millennial reign will come. We will rule with him. And at the end, that great white throne judgment, which we don't have to be a part of, when those who have rejected him will finally be departed forever, and then we go to live with him in the city of God, where it says the earth is his footstool, the city of God hovering above the earth. Oh, what a faith builder. What a faith builder is reading those last four verses of Daniel chapter 9, the most precise fulfilled Bible prophecy written. Aren't we glad he put it there for us? And don't we have so much to look forward to? We want to be, a, we want to be ready. Do not be ashamed at his coming. Any moment we could hear that trumpet sound. Oh, I feel quite tired in a wonderful way. Next week, we begin Daniel chapter 10. Until then, you be blessed indeed.